So, sure. so to today go? we're going to talk through uh, what I'm going to call the argument from science. Yes. Uh, this was the last um, part of the CES letter from uh, Jeremy Runnels, which I find um, a little disingenuous and exhausting personally, but I wanted to at least cover everything that was in there so that um, it was very clear that uh, things were covered. So th this I find, I think most everyone will know, but we're going to do it just to, to cover our, our bases. So um, we have quite a few sources. The BYU Evolution Packet's available online. We're going to talk about evolution tonight. Um, B.H. Cool. Roberts, The Truth, The Way, The Life. Um, really fascinating uh, book. Um, second edition's better and has some introductory material by, by some scholars. So a couple of a couple of articles, uh, a book uh, talking about um, evolution and mixing that with scripture, uh, and then another article by, by William Bradshaw. So the argument from science, um, as given by the CS letter, um, starts like this. The problem Mormonism encounters is that so many of its claims are well within the realm of scientific study and as such can be proven or disproven. To cling to faith in these areas where the overwhelming evidence is against it is willful ignorance, not spiritual dedication. So he actually only prevents, uh, presents two claims, um, not many. So I, I would be interested if, if uh, others presented many, but we're going to talk about the two claims that he says are well within the realm of, of scientific study. Hey, before you proceed, CES does not stand for Church Education System. Yes, it does. It does. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He, remember, he claimed that he wrote this to a, the director of his of C, uh, the area CES where he was living. Um, that he claimed that he wrote had these questions and that he wrote this letter to him and never received a response, and this prompted his eventual exit from the church. So that's there. That's why it's called uh, it's letter to a CES director or the CES oh, letter. Okay. It's very. It's kind of a new thing online, but it's like I said, just kind of. Adding in a bunch of criticisms that have been around for decades. So Jeremy Reynolds is the guy who wrote the letter and yes. didn't get the responses and left yes. the church. Yep. Okay. Oh, He's yeah. since gone yeah. on and done interviews and it's online. He claims it's been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. Yeah, and like I said, I, I, it's about an 89-page document, but we've gone through really everything that he's talked about. But it's um, everything been, has been around for a long time. And like we've discussed, it, you know, it's um, many things are just really incorrect or rely on assumptions that nobody actually believes, like that the Book of Mormon is a literalistic translation and on and on and on. Okay. So, um, okay, so to cling to faith where uh, science is overwhelming uh, is, is the claim. So then he says this, um, 2 Nephi 2.22 and Alma 12, 23 and 24 state that there is no death of any kind. Humans, all animals, birds, fishes, dinosaurs, etc. on this earth until, quote, the fall of Adam according to DNC 77, 6 and 7 occurred 7,000 years ago. It is scientifically established there has been life and death on this planet for billions of years. How does the church reconcile this? He goes on, if Adam and Eve are the first humans, how do we explain the 14 other hominid species who lived and died 35,000 to 250,000 years before Adam? When did those guys stop being human? So to put this in, uh, again, a little bit more of a, a structured format of an argument, it would go something like this. The LDS church requires members to believe that there was, quote, no death of any kind on the earth prior to 7,000 years ago, and that Adam and Eve are the first, quote, unquote, humans. Presumus B would, of course, be that science has established that there has been life and death on this planet for billions of years, and for example, 14 other hominid species living. Therefore, the LDS Church demands that members believe something that is contradicted by science. It's not rational to believe things that are contradicted by science. If the LDS Church teaches irrational ideas, Joseph Smith could not have been, had the plates, and the Book of Mormon cannot be a functional translation of those plates. Therefore, he didn't have them, and the Book of Mormon is not a functional translation. This is the best I could come up with in terms of tying it to an LDS truth claim. If the LDS church nowadays is promoting, uh, demanding members believe something that is con contradicted by science, or something that is therefore irrational, um, Joseph Smith couldn't have been uh, inspired as a, as a prophet. That's the best I could do to tie it in. Nobody ties it in, but I'm trying to, trying to help them with their argument there. So let's look at these premises. LDS church teaches that God... or that God teaches or that members are required to believe there's no death of any kind. Um, this premise seems entirely ignorant of more than a hundred years of LDS thought. And it's here where I'm going to be fairly blunt with folks that claim to have read for thousands of hours and yet have no understanding of over a hundred years of LDS thought on this particular issue, for example. So a brief 100-year history of LDS thought on death prior to 7,000 years ago and pre-Adamites. 
As early as 1881, as a 22-year-old teacher at Brigham Young Academy, James Talmadge, who was an apostle, had, quote, resolved to do many good among the young, probably lecture on the subject of harmony between geology and the Bible, a subject upon which so many of our people have mistaken ideas. Talmadge unquestionably accepted the established fact of the great age of the earth, as well as the existence of, and death of life forms before the time of Adam. And this was like 1881. In the early 1830s, we have this uh, really interesting conflict between Joseph Fielding Smith um, and B.H. Roberts. B.H. Uh, Roberts was a proponent of uh, evolution as a, as a creation process, um, everything that, that James Talmadge was. Joseph Fielding Smith was uh, very much what we would call nowadays a, a creationist. Um, so there, there was no death before the fall. All things were created perfect in, in the garden. Um, so... Uh, there was this uh, kind of this debate, and the <coughs> presidency of the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve actually bring them both in to give their arguments to them, and they they put out a statement that says something like this: the statement by Elder Smith, he had given a, a speech that Beatrice Roberts was concerned would be um, accepted as LDS doctrine. So this is their response: the statement by Elder Smith that the pre exist that the existence of pre Adamites is not a doctrine of the Church is true. It is just as true that the statement, there were not pre-Adamites upon the earth, is not a doctrine of the church. Neither side of the controversy has been accepted as a doctrine at all. So even as early as the 1830s, the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve were saying that we don't have a view on this, quite frankly, that you can believe what you want to believe. They didn't kick out Joseph Fielding Smith, nor subsequent people that believe God instantiated everything 7,000 years ago, nor did they kick out B.H. Roberts and James Talmadge and those that believe that uh, there had been life and pre-Adamites on this earth for billions of years. In 1992, in an effort to quell numerous disputes on the BYU campus, this is LDS Church's view on evolution, a group of faculty assembled what is now called the BYU Packet. That's what I mentioned as our first source on evolution. The packet consists of four statements, a 1909 First President Statement, a 1910 Improvement Area Article, 1925 Statement, and Encyclopedia of Mormonism. Um, so this packet was subsequently approved by the BYU Board of Trustees, which included senior general authorities and members of the First Presidency. In 2007, BYU administrators directed that the packet be referred to as, quote, the BYU packet on the evolution and the origin of man. Its role remains the same, namely as the authoritative source of the LDS Church's views on evolution. Um, even in 2005, 2000, whenever they're asked about it, this is what they refer to. For, right, in the media and the press, if you're at BYU, this is what they'll refer to. So according to LDS Church headquarters, According to Randy Hall, this is Assistant Superintendent of the LDS Church Educational System, seminary teachers are told to refer to church statements included in what is known as the BYU packet, naming the statements. And this is a good, uh, you can read through all of them, but this is a good synopsis. The statements are somewhat vague, but do include sentences such as, man is a child of God, formed in the divine image, and endowed with divine attributes, and Adam is the primal parent of our race. The packet does not include more clearly anti-evolution, anti-evolution and off-quoted unofficial statements such as those by Elder Board K. Packer and we could mention Joseph Fielding Smith and others. Okay, So if you read through all of these, what does it talk about? It talks about these core ideas that man is a child of God formed in his image and Adam is in some way the primal parent of our race. Right, But it does not really uh, go into the, um, how that happened. Okay, I have a question. Yes. So, um, Elder Boy K. Packer and um, Joseph Fielding Smith, when they made those statements, um, they're unofficial, meaning that they are they weren't given like in a conference as doctrine or whatever. Even conference things aren't doctrine, and that's what we'll get into. We have um, our view of doctrine is um, is very hard to pin down. Our view of doctrine comes from. Um, kind of culturally how we take scripture over time and as a community what we do with it. So, so, so like, there's things, right, that, that everyone, when you try and pin down what is doctrine, right, the, and we'll go into this, the, really the only thing you can pin down is the 13 questions that are asked before you get a temple recommend. If you can answer yes to every one of those questions, then you are fine with LDS doctrine. Um, in other words, it's, and, and critics really dislike this, by the way, right? Critics, because they like to take, take a statement, like Boyd Packers, yeah, right? Yeah. And they like to say, 
This is what all Mormons believe, and if you don't believe it, you're not Mormon, and if you do believe it, you're dumb, or whatever, right? Oh. And they'll do that with lots of different statements. And then if you come and you say, well, actually, I don't believe that, and I'm still a member, they'll say something like, well, you have to, and I'll say, no, I don't, right? So you get in this debate often with critics about what I must believe. We're going to go into what we must believe, and it's actually a very small, uh, very limited amount of, of ideas that we must believe, okay? So, um, so the idea of doctrine is what I'm saying is... Um, it's hard to pin down in our culture. And there's, I can point you to really interesting articles that discuss this. There's actually a big literature about how to, how do we understand doctrine. So if you're interested in that, I can, I can send you that for sure. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, so um, even if it was stated from the pulpit or what, I, what I'm saying is that's not, that doesn't qualify it as what we must believe. That doesn't qualify it as something that must be believed by a member. So, um, so, the official position on evolution is we have no position, and uh, upstanding members have had various positions. So, does the LDS Church teach that God teaches there was no death of any kind, and that uh, there were no humans or no pre-Adamites? Um, no, this premise is false. There's a wide latitude for views on this matter, uh, with general authorities and, and lay people debating this issue. Um, there are many who accept Elias' true claims that think there was death prior to the fall, that hominem species existed. I'm one of them, for example. I think the evolutionary record is clear. Um, but again, I'm not here to debate that point. Um, I'm here to say that there's wide latitude for views, and there are many that accept Elias' true claims that do not accept this, this proposition. So therefore, the argument fails. Therefore, uh, so premise C. Therefore, the LDS Church demands that members believe something that is contradicted by science. Again, this premise seems entirely ignorant <laughs> of more than 100 years of LDS thought about the relationship between um, the LDS Church's theology and scientific thought and scientific reasoning. So, let's go through a brief 100-year history on the LDS Church and its relationship with science. Let's start with Joseph Smith. He claimed that he was told to seek both spiritual and secular knowledge to learn, quote, all things that pertain to the kingdom of God that are expedient for us to understand, of things both in heaven and in earth and under the earth, things which have been, things which are, things which must shortly come to pass. This is a broad statement of, of, of secular and spiritual seeking. We have statements about reading the best books, right? So, so Joseph Smith saying in his own words, one of the grand fundamental principles of Mormonism is to receive truth, let it come for where, from where it may, right? Brigham Young was also a, um, a proponent. God has revealed all the truth that is now in the possession of the world, whether it be scientific or religious. He also said at another time, God is the author of the sciences. You can see not, there's no anti-scientific bent from the founder and the second leader of Mormonism. John Taylor the third, describing the religion of the Latter-day Saints, John Taylor said that it, quote, embraces every principle of truth and intelligence pertaining to us as moral, intellectual, mortal and immortal beings pertaining to this world and the world that is to come. We are open to truth of every kind, no matter whence it comes, where it originates or who believes in it. A man in search of the truth has no particular system to sustain, no particular dogma to defend or theory to uphold. I love how he stated that. We're going to keep going. The first and fundamental principle of our holy religion is that we have the right to embrace all and every item of the truth without limitation or without being circumscribed or, or prohibited by the creeds and the superstitious notions of men. This is why he stayed away from creeds. The closest we come to a creed, mm -hmm. right, is the 13 Article of Faith, with, which he didn't really intend as a creed. He wrote as a letter to a newspaper man asking him what we believed, and, and he said, right? But he stayed away from creeds and other okay. things that would tie people down to things that may not be true, Did right? He was well, very, very cognizant of that. But, yeah, we're adding doctrine. I never thought it was right to call up a man and try him because he erred in doctrine. It looks too much like Methodism and not like Latter-day Saintism. Methodists have creeds which a man must believe or be kicked out of the church. I want the liberty of believing as I please. It feels so good not to be trammeled. James E. Talmadge gave a speech in 1931 called The Earth and Man about the age of the earth and the origin and nature of Adam's race. It did win approval by the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve, and it emphasized that the geology and scripture, quote, cannot be fundamentally opposed, though man's interpretation of either may seriously be at fault. So let's do a case study. The second um, thing that, that, the second item that uh, 
that Mr. Runnels claims must be believed by uh, members of the church, the first being that there was no death or pre-Adamites, is this. Uh, Noah's flood, a global flood. He, he, this is quoting uh, Jeremy again. Science has proven that there was no worldwide flood 4,500 years ago. Do you really literally believe in the flood story where a 600-year-old Noah built a massive ark with dimensions that equate to about 450 feet long, blah, 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 that Noah and his very small family took two of each unclean creature and seven of every clean creature and all the food and fresh water that would be needed on board for six months. But after the flood, Noah and his family released the animals and they, along with Noah's family, of eight repopulated via incest the entire planet. Simple mathematics show that there was insufficient room on the ark to house all the animal species found on the planet, let alone the food required to feed them all. How did the carnivores survive? Um, he actually understates the case. You can show via biological diversity and all sorts of other reasons why um, this proposition is not um, scientifically valid, but we'll let him continue. Uh, there would not have been a nearly enough herbivores to stay in the carnivores during the voyage and the months after the ark landed. What would the herbivores eat after the flood subsided? There are a bunch of other problems with the global flood and Noah's ark story. But I find it incredible that this is supposed to be taken, literally considering the abundance of evidence against it. Am I expected to believe in a God who would wipe out the entire planet like that, kill millions of women and innocent children for the actions of others? What kind of God is this? So again, here's the, the claim, right, is right. that it's supposed to be taken literally um, by members of the church, right? That we must believe in a global flood that occurs along the lines of what he's saying. So let's, we, we talked about James Talmadge. He said, look, um, in our thought, um, we, there cannot be a contradiction between geology, science, and scripture, although we may err in interpreting one or the other or both. So let's first do some scriptural analysis of the Noah and, and the flood story. Um, anybody ever heard of the documentary hypothesis? I'll give you a little background here. It's one of the three models used to explain the origins and composition of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, right? The other two being the supplementary hypothesis and the fragmentary hypothesis. This is, I literally pulled this from like Wikipedia, I think. So, all three agree that the Torah is not a unified work from a single author, traditionally Moses, but is made up of sources combined over many centuries by many hands. They differ on the nature of these sources and how they were combined. So, according to the documentary hypothesis, hypothesis there's four sources, they call them J, P, and they have, they have different names, right? Each originally a separate and independent book, right? So, according to the documentary hypothesis, there's four separate ones. And someone redacts them and, and puts them into one. They join together. Uh, the fragmentary hypothesis sees the Torah as a collection of small fragments. And then the supplementary hypothesis as a single core document supplanted by fragments taken from many sources. This would probably be closest to what I think um, uh, the majority, uh, not majority, what many LDS scholars would, would hold to. Something like the supplementary hypothesis where Moses was involved in the creation of uh, of, a, of a text, but that that was then supplemented by other sources throughout time and changed and some things happened to it. Um, anyway, so this is, this is an overview of the documentary hypothesis. A version of this hypothesis was almost universally accepted. So if you'd asked mainline biblical scholars, how did the Torah, how was the Torah created? Um, for the most of the 20th century, you would have heard documentary hypothesis. This is now collapsed, um, 2014. Um, so now you wouldn't get a uni universal, there was four sources, you might get more fragmentary, right? So just as a sense of where, where we are from a, a biblical criticism point of view. So a classic example of this, of understanding how a narrative is spliced is the story of Noah. It contains contradictions, redundancies to the inclusions of multiple doublets. In fact, it's used by uh, Richard Friedman to demonstrate the phenomenon in Who Wrote the Bible. It's often the text of choice in introductory classes to teach the documentary hypothesis. It's a great text for teaching the documentary hypothesis. So what are the doublets? Uh, God notes that humans are wicked twice. God tells Noah of his decision to wipe all, out all life forms twice. God tells Noah to gather a pair of each animals to put on the ark twice. The story records that Noah fulfills God's command twice, 6 and 22 and 7 and 5. No one and his family got on the ark twice. The flood starts twice. Animals, you get the picture, right? A lot of things are, are doubled up. Um, even his sons are introduced twice. He sends out a raven. He uh, sends out a dove and then does the same. It also, it also includes um, what we call terminological doublets, so two distinct phrases that describe the same thing. So, so God is sometimes called uh, Yahweh, right? And he's sometimes called God. Um, so it's very clearly, right, two distinct um, words saying the same thing. Sometimes God destroys the earth. Sometimes God wipes them off the surface of the ground. 
the sur surface of the ground dries and the earth dries. So they use, right, if it was one author, he would use the same word to describe the same thing, but we're getting two different words to describe the same thing often. There's contradictions. So is Noah supposed to bring one pair of animal, one pair of each kind of animal, or is he supposed to bring seven pairs of clean animals plus birds and only one pair of unclean animals? Do the floodwaters come from God allowing the waters of the depths and the heavens to overflow, or does it come from the excess rain only? As a, as a side note here, uh, just to understand how they are writing this, the Hebrews imagine that the earth floated on the waters below. Right? So you have earth and you have waters below that the earth is, is floating on. And then they were capped by a semicircular dome. I think a biodome, that great movie. Uh, that, that's what they called the firmament. Right? So when you read the firmament, they're, they're talking about this dome or vault of heaven with an unlimited reservoir of waters above the firmament. So the firmament's holding the waters, right? So the firmament had openings in it to allow the waters from above to fall in the form of rain. And the waters below the earth were also unlimited. These waters symbolize chaos. So most texts in the Hebrew Bible do assume this three-tiered world of earth, water below, firmament, and water above. So does the flood last 40 days or 40 nights or 150 days? Um, and then the pack. So that we have some contradictions. In fact, what's really cool is that each of the two texts is largely complete and internally consistent. So I'm actually going to show you. Uh, I put it here. You can get on the, the Torah.com textual study of Noah's flood. And you can actually see... So here's what they call the P text in blue um, and, and the J text in, in red. So you can actually read both of these stories. And so they've taken the right, they've taken the story that's put together in Genesis and, and pulled out the two different versions and put them in, and they make perfect sense when read independently or by themselves, right? So um, here's where he actually puts them uh, the combined text. Right? So if you read it. You know, Yahweh saw how great man's wickedness on the earth and how every plan devised by his mind was nothing but evil all the time. He regretted that he made man. His heart was saddened. He said, I will blot, him the, blot men out from the earth, men from whom I created, together with the beast, but Noah found favor, favor with Yahweh. And then if you skip to here, then Yahweh said, no, go into the ark with all your household. So in other words, you can very clearly split apart these, these two textual traditions into two distinct stories. You can see how they were combined into one for the current version that we have. Mm -hmm. So you can go there and, and read through it. It's actually um, very fun. So. What about Moses? Um, what about Moses? The book of Moses, it has, is it combined too? It's a, no, it's, it, Joseph's version differs quite a bit, um, especially in terms of like this morality. section where the sons of God having sexual relations with the daughters of men. And Joseph, in, not Joseph, in the Moses oh, version yeah. of the text, mm -hmm. you have... Um, the, you have men having um, sex with their daughters, kind of you have more ancestral relationships rather than um, kind of a, a mixture of angels and whatnot. So, um, so, even, so even that text is different than, and it's not combined, it, it's not, it doesn't have kind of the two textual traditions, but it yeah. is different from both. Yeah, I first heard of this through Nibley. So, a uh, relationship to other literature. Biblical stu story of the flood has parallels in other literature. The flood story in Genesis begins, like we talked about, with the cryptic reference of the sons of God having sexual relations with the daughters of men. This mixture of giants, what we call Nephilim, and mortals produce the mighty men or heroes. The ref references to worldwide floods and sexual relations between the di divine beings and humans in an age of giants are reminiscence of several ancient Mediterranean and Near Eastern myths. The earliest flood narratives are apparently written by the Sumerians, the most famous being the myth of Gilgamesh. So you can read that. Um, you can, I put on here for a summary of Near Eastern flood myths. So in short, it appears that the transmission of the biblical flood story was profoundly influenced by Near Eastern mythology, as well as having two different textual traditions included in it. Now, let's look at how the variance and how LDS authors has, have looked at this text. Um, Bruce McClunky <coughs> gives us kind of what we would call the, the fundamentalist view he, in his famous Mormon doctrine. Um, unfortunate title. <laughs> in the days of Noah, the Lord sent a universal flood, which completely immersed the whole earth and destroyed all flesh, except that uh, preserved by the ark. I think he recognizes he's on shaky um, scientific ground because he puts in this note. Um, Many of the so-called geological changes in the earth's surface 
which according to ge geological theories took place over, over ages of time, in reality occurred in a matter of a few short weeks, incident to the universal deluge. As a note, he does not explain where this information came from or cite yeah. any source at all to support it. This would be the, um, again, the more fundamentalist view of, of universal flood, certainly held by Bruce McConkie and other uh, believing Latter-day Saints. John Whitsoe, on the other hand, uh, says things like this. We should remember that when inspired writers deal with historical incidents, they relate that which they have seen or that which they've been told to them, unless indeed the past is open to them by revelation. What's he saying here? Saying people that wrote this down were just hearing stories, right? And they're going to rely on those stories just like we would unless they were open to, to them in some sort of you know, vision. So it's basically make-believe. Um, not necessarily make-believe. Kernels of truth yeah. that, would, that would accumulate um, falsehoods and, and accumulate... Uh, bigger, right? The stories get bigger over time, generally speaking, especially if you're a fisherman. Mm -hmm. So he says that the exactly. scriptures must be read intelligently, and he says, the, in fact, the details of the flood are not known to us. It is doubtful whether the water in the sky and all the oceans would suffice to cover the earth so completely. He clearly did not believe in a universal flood, right? Um, Morris Peterson, writing in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, under the Great Flood, it appears as a subdivision on the entry earth, uh, the entry acknowledges the lack of empirical data to support a literal universal flood and simply cites the same sort of material at, as Witso. So even in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, we don't get um, Bruce McConkie's universal flood. In the, so, so again, just giving you varied ideas around the flood. Andrew Skinner in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, similarly on the entry of Noah, says simply, Noah became second father with Adam of all mankind following the flood. And the remaining page or so of material discusses, as it should, Noah's importance and role as a prophet. So it similarly stays away from understanding it as, as a universal flood. There's lots of other ways to understand uh, Noah becoming second father through covenant and, and other means rather than um, pure um, ancestry. So one paper looked at nearly 400 sermons from church leaders who discuss Noah and the flood. And these were some bullet points gleaned from those more than 400 sermons from um, journal discourses all the way up through the early 80s. In LDS sermons, Noah is clearly understood to be a historical character, and the flood is usually assumed to be a historical event. But other than these two implicit assumptions, rarely are historical claims about the flood expressed in LDS sermons. LDS leaders have demonstrated far more interest in the story's moral, social, and existential symbolism than its historical details. The point of these sermons is how to exercise faith, right? It's a moral, uh, a moral story, how to exercise faith, how to live in a corrupt world about, about to be destroyed, how to maintain faith in the LDS church, it's an existential symbolism, um, despite scoffing of critics and so forth, right? So they, they're much more interested in, in using the story for these teachings than they are um, proclaiming um, historical claims about it. Um, we're, we're doing some scriptural analysis, both in the, the, we went through the textual history of Noah and the flood, we then went through some, some of the ways in which um, LDS uh, authors have written about it, from uh, the very, uh, very traditionalist Bruce McConkie to, to Witzel. We've looked at some sermons that are, um, that are inconclusive. Um, and so our conclusions are, are as follows. Joseph Smith embraced a dynamic religious view. The freedom to believe, the freedom to question, the freedom to pursue intellectual truth. We, we showed that over and over through his writings, through his re revelations, and through the, the, um, the people like Brigham and, and John that came after him. Um, he was stayed away from creedalism. He stayed away from, uh, he said he didn't like to be trammeled. So he really allowed us, and he allows us, this dynamic view um, to, to allow people to have different points of view on lots of different things. This has led us as a culture, hopefully, to an openness towards scientific discovery. The view that science and scripture cannot be fundamentally opposed, although man's interpretation of either may be seriously at fault, right? So we have examples of that, right? We have bad scripture reading. So there's problems when we read apparent contradi contradictions with literalistic interpretations of scripture, such as no pre-fall death at all or worldwide flood. I do see you know, big problems with reading reading the Genesis account of, of Noah as requiring a worldwide flood. We just showed that. I think there's problems with reading scripture as requiring no pre-fall death. So there's, there's bad scripture reading, bad hermeneutics there. And we've also had bad science, right? For example, scientific racism was common during the period from the 1600s to the end of World War I. Right. This scientific consensus, quote-unquote, influenced LDS leaders. So you have Brigham Young citing... Uh, scientific racism for a proposition that um, African Americans are not equal 
to uh, to white people, uh, to people of, uh, to, of European descent. So um, we have bad science, we have bad scripture. Uh, humility in both scripture interpretation and scientific claims is is warranted. Um, it's fun to, to do both, but we have to be cognizant that we've made huge, huge mistake and mistakes in the quote unquote scientific consensus, and we've made really bad mistakes with with reading of scripture. Mm -hmm. So we want to be uh, we want to be humble in both of those as we work in this uh, this process, and that's why it's so fun. That's why it is really so fun. Among Mormons, as a side note, those who are more highly educated are not simply as religious as those with less education. Education, excuse me, Mormons with college experience are more religiously observant on average than Mormons with less education. So what I'm citing here is, um, it's if it were the case that, again, science. all science precludes belief in LDS truth claims, this should be opposite, right? When you go to a university, when you start reading the sciences. You ought to, as a consequence, um, become less observant. That's actually flipped. So as you fully 92% of college-educated Mormons are highly religious, as are 91% of Mormons with some college. But among Mormons whose education topped out with the high school, just 78% score on the high index of religious observance by study by Pew in April of 2017. Um, I see, so I don't see any concrete evidence, um, nor do I see any rational evidence that um, the argument from science is valid at all that, that he's presenting. Yeah. Arguments that contain premises about what, quote, quote, members must believe. Anytime you see an argument against LDS truth claims about, quote, mem what they must believe are always false unless those assertions are covered in the Temple Recommend interview questions, which are as follows. Do you have faith in and a testimony of God, the Eternal Father, and Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost? Notice. Does it talk about anything about our understanding of the Trinity here? We talked about different models of the Trinity, the social Trinity. We talked about modalism. We talked about tritheism. No. Are we ever asked, do you subscribe to a social model of the Trinity? No, right? Yeah. Do you have faith in, right? Yeah. God seems le far less concerned with the conceptual conceptions we have in our mind and far more concerned with our actions and our motivation. So, do you have a testimony of the atonement of Christ and his role as Savior and Redeemer? Amen. Notice, we talked about different theories of the atonement, right? We talked about uh, theories that, that I think are crazy, and we talked about, uh, you know, the moral satisfaction theory, all, all sorts of different theories. Are we ever asked, do you hold, right, to a particular theory of the atonement of Jesus Christ? We're not. You can believe whatever you want about how the atonement is efficacious as long as you feel that it's efficacious in your life. Do you have a testimony of the restoration of the gospel in these of the latter days? Notice, are you asked anything about, do you know that on you know, April, tw June 12th, the Melchizedek priesthood was restored? Because we debate the, the timing of when the Melchizedek priesthood was restored. We don't, right? Do you have a testimony of the restoration of the gospel? We don't even... Um, the content of that is left to the member. The content of that is left between you and God. Do you sustain the presence of the Church of Jesus Christ? We talked about different views of sustaining in our talk about infallibility. We talked about reasons for accepting LDS doctrine as authoritative in our life and how we deal with hard situations where we feel that um, things are wrong. We're asked if we sustain, but we're not given some, um, some definition of, of sustain. We're not even given a definition of prophets here in Revelator. We talked about what how we would define a prophet through the scriptures as someone that has authority but sometimes makes mistakes. And we talked about that definition. But we're not given a definition, right? That's, that's up to you. What are the other ones? Do you live the law of chastity? Nothing about, nothing about knowledge there. Anything in your conduct related to the members of your family? This is the closest you get. Do you support or affiliate with or agree with any group or individual whose teachings or practices are contrary to or oppose those accepted? By the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Saints. This is the closest we get to some sort of um, some sort of doctrinal um, litmus test. You'll notice that those and and certainly there's been periods in our periods in our history when um, when the church the, the leaders of the church have been less um, less accepting of those that have that that are pushing the bounds of intellectual curiosity and freedom. We've had mistakes made by fallible leaders that have excommunicated members wrongly. Um, Abraham Gileadi, Gileadi, for example, is a, a prime example of that. Uh, one of the foremost um, scholars of Isaiah in, in the world. Um, you, you should look him up and, and read his works on Isaiah, and also read his um, or watch some of his uh, his testimonies. Just 
unbelievable. Um, born in Holland, most of his life grew up, born in Holland during World War II. His dad was like hiding, um, hiding uh, members of the resistance in Holland. They moved to uh, New Zealand where he became uh, very religious, moved to Israel where he became, lived in a kibbutz and uh, became actually converted to Judaism, found the Book of Mormon there um, in a kibbutz library, read it, knew it was true, but could never make contact with the church, lived another three years there, um, came a monk, did all this stuff, joined the church, was baptized in Israel, and uh, got a PhD. Anyway, just fascinating individual, but he was excommunicated as part of the September 6th, um, so the, a group of kind of scholars and intellectual people that were excommunicated in 1991. Um, okay. He always felt that it was wrong, um, and for ten years. But he, you know, he didn't. He how he chose to deal with it was very interesting. Uh, he didn't blog. He didn't go denouncing people. He lived for ten years, and um, when the church brought him back, they actually expunged his entire record, essentially admitting that it was incorrect, that that he was he shouldn't have been excommunicated. And he's um, so look, are mistakes made? Absolutely, mistakes are made. Fallible people at times are people less. Um, are they following Joseph Smith's mantra of dynam dynamism and uh, not, you know, being trammeled? Sometimes we do that, but um, as a as a whole, that the the goal, the 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 standard Joseph set, sets is wide latitude, wide latitude in terms of our thought, in terms of what we think. So this is as close as we get. Other than that, keep the commandments, being honest, paying tithing, keeping the word of wisdom. So what was the group that was not? A good group to be part of. Oh, I, I'm just saying, uh, his his wasn't any group. His was based on a, a book that he read wrote, wrote about Isaiah for some reason, and there was, it was he he never really got a good answer about why he was excommunicated. So that was contrary to this one at that time. And that. I'm just saying this would have been. Um, this is the closest. I'm just saying I was making the point that we make mistakes, yeah. and 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 um, and I don't want to give the the appearance that I think that you know. Everyone's perfect. The leaders. No, we went through fallibility. I was saying this is the closest we get to being asked about doctrinal leanings. But even this is pretty amorphous. You get some of this now with uh, ordained women. The the one of the founders of ordained women, Kate Kelly, was excommunicated, um, and, and she's been very vocal uh, about um, very vocal and very public, um, saying that uh, women should be ordained. Um, that is a practice that's contrary right now, and and she has been very vocal. So something's. I'm trying to think of other groups. Maybe um, like something LGBT related or something. I like no, I'm not, I'm not heard of any. Um, the polygamous you know, groups. Polygamous groups. You like, you'll, you'll, you'll be excommunicated if you're part of polygamous group. What well, was more serious, I think, in the 50s and 60s, when if you were living in southern Utah, because those groups are infiltrating Mormon cities and marrying people and taking them back, so they had blood on the on their hands with that one. So. Yeah. But even that, right? We're, we're, you're not asked about it. You're not asked to. There's not some list of of <laughs> of groups. Do you belong to A through Z, right? You're just asked, um, and and you can ha and you have that discussion with between you and your bishop, and, and it's based on what you think. Do I, do do you think you you know that you affiliate or agree with a group that's opposed? Well, you should talk about it. But again, in terms of content, we we stay away from it. There there just isn't here. Uh, so we have word of wisdom, tithe payer. Financial obligations, um, wearing of the garment, and do you consider yourself worthy? So, what do we have to believe, right? And if any <laughs> premise starts with members must believe X, right? We have to be very, very careful because there's very, very little that we have to believe. Well, and this is a temple reckoning. I mean, what percentage of members actually hold active recommends? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, it's, it's not like. But uh, th this would be the this would be the height of creedalism, goal. right? This will be the height of. In other words, if, if they're trying to prove to you, if a critic is saying you must believe this, and you say why, why why must I believe that? Right. If you say what's the highest form of worship that I have? Well, it's going the to the temple, temple and, and okay. worshiping the temple. So to do that, I have to on honestly answer thirteen questions. Okay. None of them have to do with believing in a universal flood. Um, no pre-Adamites, um, on and on and on, whatever they want to bring up, right? This is what they are, okay. right? I, I don't have to have a certain theory of the Trinity, of the Atonement, of any of those things, right? So that's what I'm saying is that the, the, the content about what we must believe is actually very small. Um, now we're encouraged to have beliefs, we're encouraged to read scriptures, study, right? do all those things, 
but we have the latitude, and that's what's so wonderful about the religion Joseph Smith founded. Yeah, it's, well, not having creeds is really huge, because you don't have to believe in the concepts of man. You can connect right with God and say, what does the atonement mean for yeah. me? Whereas with the creeds, it says you have to believe what this guy says, and if you disagree with him, then you're in jeopardy. Yep. Yeah, you, you, you spend a lot of time, like I said, if we, if we did that, we would get together and... I would argue passionately for my, you know, moral satisfaction theory of the atonement, and, and others would argue, you know, for their penal substitution, and the first presidency would get in there and we'd, and we'd structure language about what the atonement means, right? That's what you do with the creed. That's what they did yeah. with, uh, with the Trinity. That's what they did with, um, uh, with, with sin and with, um, with all sorts of things. So we don't do that. We stay away yeah. from, from doing that, and therefore it's left to um, you individually to, to believe and to read and to think. And, and revelation. Yeah, and... and and on we go. So, okay. um, so our conclusion is that arguments that contain premises about what members must believe are always false unless those assertions are covered in the, t covered in the Temple Recommend interview questions. So this includes Mr. Reynolds' assertions that members must believe in a global flood and that there is no death on earth prior to 7000 BC. Again, those were the two things that he you know, said were uh, among the many mm -hmm. uh, apparent uh, beliefs of Latter-day Saints, which are... Um, that are absolutely contradicted by science. So, um, the, this idea again that um, that our our faith is uh, easily dismissed by scientific inquiry, I think, is just patently absurd, and it doesn't uh, take seriously hundreds of years of thought uh, in our culture about the you know the integration of science and religion, the debates that we've had internally about these issues of flood and um, and evolution. Um, and it, it doesn't really understand the religion at all. It doesn't understand the essence of it, which was what Joseph Smith said that he, he, he accepted truth from whoever and he, and he welcomed scientific inquiry um, and he didn't like to feel trammeled. So um, anyway, I, I find it, again, very difficult to believe that, um, that uh, folks like this that have these questions have been sincere because it's so easy to find all this material in terms of our debates. Um, so that's it. Any questions on the arguments from science?